Why, hello there, my classy companions of food selection and prep. At this point, you've probably heard a little bit about this stable isotope project that we're going to be working on in terms of collecting food and how your role is going to be played in it. Right now, I just want to compose a short little video going over some of the theory of the biomarker that we're working on, how the food selection and prep team is going to help us with this collaboration, and also just give a little run through of what we do here in the lab. So the main principle of this biomarker is based on differences between C4 and C3 plants. If you remember back to GenBio, C4 and C3 refer to the two different types of photosynthesis that are used to fixate carbon to produce glucose. Now 95% of the plants in the world produce their glucose via the C3 photosynthetic pathway, and only 5% produce their glucose via the C4 photosynthetic pathway. Most of the plants that we consume in our diet are actually C3 plants, but two notable exceptions exist, and those are corn and sugarcane. Uh, notably, especially to this project that we're doing right now, uh, C4 plants make up 78% of our, the added sugar that we consume in our diet as high fructose corn syrup and sugarcane. If you have the majority of C4 plants are added sugar, and there's really not a whole lot of other C4 plants in our diet other than whole corn, which doesn't really make up a very large proportion of our diet. So, C4 plants make up a majority of added sugar in our diet and don't make up a whole lot of anything else. So why is this important? So, C4 plants, let's just get a little bit on the board, make up 5% of our diet, but 78% of the added sugar. And C3 plants, make up 95% of our diet, but do not make up a whole, a very large proportion of added sugar. Well, C4 plants actually have a different stable isotope uh, composition of their carbon than C3 plants do. Uh, this is based on different enzymatic reactions that occur within the two pathways. So for C4 plants, so C4 plants, their stable isotope uh, their basically their stable isotope signature is about negative 10 to negative 12, which we record as delta values. You don't really need to know what these mean, you just need to know that they're different. Uh, with C3 plants, the delta values are in the negative 25 to negative 27 range, somewhere around there. So there's a difference between the two, and we can measure that on our mass spec. Um, Notably, the main thing that's important to our biomarker is when you consume a C4 or a C3 plant, the glucose or the biomass that you are getting from either C4 or C3 plants is incorporated into your tissues. So when you consume a diet that is primarily C3, your tissues would have an isotopic signature around 25 to 27, whereas if you consume a diet that is more on the C4 end of the spectrum, your tissues will have more of a C4 signature, is what we call it. So how do these signatures apply to our added sugar biomarker? As I mentioned, a majority of added sugars consumed in our diet are of the C4 variety. So we came up with the hypothesis a while ago that if your tissues or if your blood has more of a C4 signature, if it's more on this end of the spectrum, then that would mean that you consumed more added sugars than somebody who is closer to this end of the spectrum since the majority of other plants consumed in their diet that aren't added sugars are C3. So this correlation between the delta value of your blood and the added sugar content of your diet has held up in preliminary trials that we've conducted. So we have found correlations that if you are more on this side of the spectrum, then that means that you've consumed more added sugar in your diet. And right now we're at the point where we need to validate this biomarker with larger scale trials. So validating this biomarker will need to be done in both small-scale trials uh, where we control the feeding and also on large-scale trials that are not controlled. Uh, conducting a small-scale clinical trial where we are able to come up with correlations between diet and tissues is actually fairly easy. So for those type of trials, we would just feed someone, let's say, three foods, I mean, we'd feed somebody more than three foods technically, that would kind of be unethical. But we'll just say we would feed them maybe wheat and rice and P 
pure sugar. And let's just say we would feed them 33% of each of these. Now, we would do this and we would come up with a hypothetical delta value for their diet. So, let's say this is negative 25, this is negative 25, this is negative 10. That would mean that their diet would be around, for the delta value, be around negative 20. We would take this delta value for the diet and then we would feed them this diet over a period of time and measure the delta value of their blood. And if it was similar to negative 20, that would mean that the biomarker is valid. So the problem becomes conducting this on a large scale where we don't control the feeding of the subjects. You see, when people come in, in those type of trials, people will come in, they will be, give us a food record, basically, where we, they tell us everything they've eaten over a period of time. And then we would try to come up with a hypothetical value for their diet. But right now, there's a very small amount of foods that have been isotopically characterized. So let's say these foods were replaced by three questionable foods that we have not characterized before. We'll go with my childhood diet, which was Oreos, cheese nips, and Dunkaroos. Um, so basically, for those three, if we had not characterized those isotopically yet, we would not be able to come up with a delta value for their diet and thus we wouldn't be able to do these validation trials. This is where your role in the food selection project comes in and how it fits into the overall success of this project. So upon us receiving them, they'll be transferred from the dry ice container into this freezer where they'll be kept until processing. We have a few foods in here right now. Basically it's just foods that we have collected in our lab over time. Um, Basically the point of this freezer is to keep things cold like all freezers do to prevent decomposition of the foods as we run through these and analyze them. So once the foods come out of that freezer right there, they'll be taken to the other side where we will freeze dry them. And even if they were dry in their original state, they'll still need to be freeze dried because either from storage at Virginia Tech or in this freezer, there will be a little bit of condensation that is built up over time. So once that, for those foods are completely dry, we're gonna take them over to this station where we'll grind them all into a fine powder, even using this mortar and pestle right here, or using this micro mill, which is basically an oversized, overpriced, very giant coffee grinder, but at least it looks scientific. So once the foods are in a fine powder state, we take them over to this station right here. This is where we're going to weigh them all out into two milligram samples, which is fairly small. And then we will fold them into little tiny squares in these tin capsules. And you can kind of see it in here, they're pretty tiny. And put them into these 96 well plates where we're gonna take these to the mass spec to be loaded. Once all the samples have been loaded in this tiny tin capsules, they're gonna be put into our elemental analyzer slash mass spec. So what this thing does, it combusts the samples at 1000 degrees Celsius, uh, turns them into gas. The gases are separated on a variety of columns in here and to produce just pure CO2 gas. So after the gases have been separated into pure CO2 gas, the gas is injected into the mass spec right here. The mass spec is able to separate by weight the CO2 that contains the heavier carbon-13 from the CO2 that contains the lighter carbon-12. And it can tell us how much of each of that is in the food sample that we just combusted. So these values are basically calculated in our computer system here to give us a ratio of the carbon-13 to the carbon-12 in this sample, which is the, ultimately turns into the delta values that we're gonna send to you and use in all of our papers to share with the rest of the world. So thank you once again, and I look forward to hearing updates from you throughout the semester.